Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over part one of the United States History and Government Framework Readings Exam. This is going to be uh, the entire multiple choice section, so questions 1 through 28. Uh, if you don't know how this works, uh, each uh, it comes in sets of two, and each each question or each pair of questions relates to usually either an image or a short blurb uh, located at the top of the passage, right? Um, so, I mean, I suggest starting these questions off by reading the passage first, right? So we're going to do that. It says, small islands not capable of protecting themselves are the proper objects for kingdoms under their care. But there is something very absurd in supposing a continent be perpetually governed by an island. In no instance hath nature made the satellite larger than its primary planet, and, as England and America, with respect to one another, reverses the common order of nature. It is evident they belong to different systems, England to Europe, America to itself, right? So what is he saying here? Pretty much, he's saying that it's illogical and unnatural for a, a smaller kingdom or a smaller nation to be subjugating or to be ruling a larger one, right? He says that in no instance of in no instance hath nature, which just means there's it's unnatural, or it never in nature is it that the larger satellite is is uh or the satellite is larger than the primary planet. So it, it is unnatural for the thing to for, for a, a larger object to orbit around a smaller object, right? It never happens. It's always the larger object. It's a, a larger object and it's being orbited by the smaller object, right? So what he's saying is that if this is America and it's massive, right? It has large, large population, large land size. America is orbiting around Britain, which is this tiny little island, right? And this isn't, this isn't how it's supposed to go. Usually it's supposed to go like this big, um, you know, big planet, small small moon small satellite orbiting around it but here it's flipped and because it's flipped it's wrong right and here he's saying that they belong to different systems right they shouldn't even be orbiting together right they should just be independent so knowing this and knowing this summary we can look at our choices right number one says trying to convince americans to remain english colonists this is wrong because he's saying that they belong to different systems so they should split number two says says suggesting that colonies join a european confederation wrong he says that they belong to two different systems england belongs to europe right and america belongs to america it's three proposing the colonies revive the articles of confederation that is a form of government right that is an article of government that is not mentioned here and that leaves us with number four urging americans to become independent from their mother country right remember they belong to different systems england to europe america to itself number two says what is the primary argument used in the passage by thomas Paine to make this point right so obviously the primary argument is that it's it's absurd and it's unnatural for a uh, for a satellite larger than its primary planet, right? So what I was saying about this stupid drawing where I made the A and the B, right? His argument is that a larger a larger colony should not be orbiting around a smaller owner, right? It just doesn't make sense, right? So the answer obviously has to be choice number two. England cannot effectively govern the countries because America is much larger, right? In no instance hath nature made a satellite larger than the primary planet. If Britain is the primary planet, then it is much smaller than its American satellite, which is unnatural, right? In other words, they belong in different system because England cannot effectively govern the colonies, right? Uh, three and four are wrong, right? Because they don't talk about self-government here, and they don't talk about France. And number one is wrong because it doesn't talk about economic relationships whatsoever, right? So moving on to number uh, three and four, it says, I'll, I'll read the uh, blurb first. It says, this policy of supplying by opposite and rival interests, the defect of better motives, might be traced through the whole system of human affairs, private as well as public. We see it particularly displayed in all the lesser distributions of power, where the constant aim is to divide and arrange several offices in such a manner as that each may be a check on another, and that the private interest of every individual may be guard over public rights. These interventions of prudence cannot be less essential in the distribution of supreme powers of the states, right? So he's arguing, so he opens this up with like a preambulatory clause, which is like, it's pretty stupid. You don't need to know what that is, right, for this test. The main juice, the main point here comes in this sentence, right, these last two sentences. He's saying that we, <clears throat> right now, we see it essential to divide and arrange several offices in such a matter that they may be, they may be a check to one another. So in order for this government to work, we need to divide that, we need to divide said government into like these branches that'll check one another, right? So that's pretty much his main argument here. And knowing that, we can move on to number three. Number three says, what was the primary reason James Madison wrote this and other Federalist papers, right? If you don't know what the Federalist papers are, it's a set of articles written by Federalists. That's what they call the Federalist papers. And the whole aim of them was to support the ratification of the Constitution. And they were, and they were 
um, trying to get people to support a federal government, right? Uh, after America gained its, its independence and after a lot of people realized how weak the Articles of Confederation were, there was this big, big debate about what the future of America would be like, right? What what should we revise this government to? What should be our next move? And you had these two groups. You had the anti-federalists, which supported, which believed that the states should have more power than the government. And you had the federalists, which means, which said that the government of the United States, that one big government should have more power than the states, right? States, government. And right, and they were fighting. Anti-federalists and federalists were constantly fighting over this over, over this policy, and to convince people to to uh, start a brand new form of government, to convince people to to become federalist and to 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 ratify the constitution. Uh, federalists wrote the Federalist Papers. It's a bunch of just a bunch of articles that were like, "Yo, federalism is great. Don't worry about anything. You're you're still gonna have rights under this government. It's gonna be awesome. Here's why. Read my article." Right. So it's number one to support the ratification of the constitution. And the Constitution effectively set up the federal government as we know it, right? So in order for the federal government to legitimately be a thing, we needed the Constitution to be ratified first. So that's why they're trying to do that. Number four says, which constitutional principle does Madison most directly describe in the passage, right? Remember when when, uh, when I was ranting about this, this underlined portion? He says, it's a constant aim to divide several offices in such a manner as that they may be a check on one another. That sounds a lot like making branches of government, right? If you divide the big government into three branches, legislative, um, executive, and judiciary, right? And <clears throat> now that you've now that you've separated them, if this branch wants to take more power, right, or wants to be corrupt, you have two other branches to keep that, that branch in check and make sure nothing, nothing funky is going on and that they're not being unconstitutional, right? So this is pretty much separation of powers between branches of government. If you're dividing the government, that means you're separating it into branches. So that's all. Judicial review, um, he wasn't talking about that. Rule of law, also no, and he wasn't. He never talked about a military. <laughs> right? So moving on to number five and six, it says, when British and French, when the British and French both seized American vessels, if they touched the, uh, at the ports of others, Jefferson decided to test one of his favorite doctrines. Right? That war was both intolerable and unnecessary, and that the best weapon against both powers lay in economic sanctions. He got Congress to pass a series of five embargo acts, uh, forbidding U.S. trade with Britain and France not only overseas, but even along the Canadian border, right? Number five asks, according to the passage, what was President Thomas Jefferson's primary objective in proposing the Embargo Acts, right? So, in other words, this is asking him, why did he propose these acts? Like, why, why, what reason? Well, if we, we read back, right, it's saying that he was testing one of his favorite doctrines, right? He was testing his favorite policy or his favorite belief. And his favorite belief was that war is intolerable and unnecessary and that the best weapon against both powers were in economic sanctions, right? The embargo acts were economic sanctions, right? This equals economic sanctions. So instead of fighting a war that is unnecessary, unnecessary and stupid, he believes in putting economic sanctions, which means like limiting trade. Instead of fighting them with our troops, we'll fight and threaten them uh, we'll fight them by like threatening trade. We'll say, oh, you know what? Since you want to invade us, oh, you know what? Since you're not treating us well, I'm not going to send my military after you. No, no, no. I'm just going to stop trading with you, right? And of course, it's to it, uh, avoid war, right? His, prim his primary objective was to avoid war. Why? Because he thought that war was both intolerable and unnecessary, right? It's a policy to avoid that. It's not to increase trade because he's forbidding U.S. trade. It's not to limit the slave trade because this is nothing. This has nothing to do with the slave trade. It doesn't say that. And to raise revenue, once again, where does it say that? It doesn't, right? So it's to avoid war because he opposed it. And number six says, what was one result of the failure of the Embargo Acts? Well, obviously, it's going to be the War of 1812, right? Uh, this Embargo Act was to stop war. It was to prevent war, right? So if something that prevents war fails, then war has to happen, you know? If I have, like, this wall that's stopping war from happening, and I no longer have this wall, war war is going to happen, you know? Um, and War of 1812 was when the British invaded the colonies because of some miscommunication um, abroad. But yeah, Louisiana Purchase doesn't make sense uh, because that's like a positive interaction between French and America. Uh, Missouri Compromise and Gib Gibbons where Ogden was a domestic issue that didn't even make sense, and the Missouri Compromise was also a domestic issue that didn't have to do, neither one of these had to do with Britain or France, right? It's the War of 1812. All right, moving on to number seven. It says that apprehension seems to exist among the people of the southern states. Okay. By the rise to power of a Republican administration, their property and their peace and personal security are to be endangered. There has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension. 
Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection. It is found it is found in nearly all published speeches of him who now address you. But I do not quote, but sorry, I do but quote from one of these speeches when I declare that I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the United States where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Right. So in the first part of this, it's Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address. Right. So this is uh, inaugural address is some is a speech that a president does when they're when they're first uh, sworn into office. Right. After they're elected. So when he's addressing the nation, what he's saying is that apprehension seems to exist among the people of Southern states. In other words, they seem worried, they seem stressed that a Republican administration or a Republican uh, politician, Republican-backed government is now in office, right? Remember that in the 1800s, right, you had a you had a, a Republican North and a Democrat South, right? And these Democrats were Southerners and they liked slavery, right? Right, these Republicans were Northerners and they opposed slavery, right? They didn't like slavery, they wanted to limit it. And at this time, right, there was a lot of tensions between the North and South. There were a lot of tensions between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans wanted to limit slavery. Democrats wanted to expand it. So when Democrats saw that there was a Republican, right, a member of the Republican Party in office, they got scared. They said, wow, this guy is a Republican and he's he's president, which means he has a lot of power. He can take away my slaves, right? He can take away my, my plantations. I am scared, right? And here it says their peace and prosperity are to be endangered, right? He thinks that they think that the Republican is a threat, right? Now, after he acknowledges that they think he's a threat, he goes on to say, I am not a threat because I don't plan to interfere with slavery, right? He says, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery, right? He does not want to interfere with slavery. He says, guys, you don't have to be worried about a Republican being in office because I'm not going to mess with your slaves. I'm not going to mess with your whole system. I'm going to leave you alone. Don't worry, right? So that's pretty much what, what this whole passage is saying. So let's look at the questions, right? Number seven says, what is one reason President Abraham Lincoln included these statements into his address, right? So why is he even saying this in the first place? Well, obviously, it's to reduce the fear of slaveholding states. What I was, what was I just uh, talking about, right? They are threatened by a Republican in office. So in order to alleviate these fears so that half the nation isn't, isn't hostile to him, so half the nation isn't afraid of him, he says, look, nothing's bad going to happen out of it. You can still live the way you want to live, right? Number eight asks, which later action by President Lincoln demonstrated a change from his 1861 position, right? So what is his position? Well, his position is right here, right? His position is that I have no lawful right to do so and I have no inclination to do so, right? Here, he says, I have no purpose to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists, right? So he's saying his position is that I, I'm not going to touch slaves. I'm not going to touch your system of slavery. Uh, it's not in my rights. It's not in the law. I, I have no power to affect slavery in the South, right? I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to affect it, right? That's his, that's his position in 1861. But later on in like 1865, he signs the Emancipation Proclamation, which declares every single slave to be free. And it declares slavery to be unconstitutional. And it, and it pretty much pushed for everyone to free their slaves, regardless of North or South, everyone was free now, right? And this is a change because over here, he's saying that I'm not going to touch slavery. And here he literally destroyed slave, slavery, right? Um, yeah, that's all. Pretty simple question. Moving on to number nine and 10, right? Let's read this. It says, thus American development has exhibited not merely advance along a single line, but a return to primitive conditions on a continually advancing frontier line in a new development for that area. American social development has been continually beginning over again on the frontier. This perennial rebirth, this fluidity of American life, this expansion westward, with its new opportunities, its continuous touch with the simplicity of primitive society fur furnish the forces dominating the American character, right? So this is uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, right? He was he was a big frontierman. He really pushed, he really, really pushed for uh, America to expand uh, west, right? And here he's saying that it's this westward expansion that makes America Americans, right? We need to expand westward, right? Because we need to constantly redevelop ourselves. We better ourselves by advancing uh, to the West, right? The more West we go, the more our culture develops, the more we rebirth as people, and the more American life prospers, right? So he's really, really, really uh, supporting Western expansion, right? So number nine says, which geographical feature this Frederick Jackson Turner suggests is a primary is as primary in the creation of the American character, right? So he's talking about this creation of American character, right? This uh, um, this expansion westward with new opportunities 
its continuous touch and simplicity of primitive society furnishes the dominating force of American character, right? So all this is saying is that ex westward expansion is the thing that is that is actually furnishing American character. Westward expansion is the thing that is making us American. It's making us more American, right? Now remember, in order to expand westward, you're going to have to settle somewhere, right? Remember, westward expansion was all about settling the Western America, right? If this is the East Coast, Texas, you know, all that, right? Westward expansion was moving west, moving west, moving west. Not just to look at the area, but to settle there, to make settlements, to make towns, to make new cities, right? And in order, in order to do that, in order to move west, you first need unsettled wilderness. You need land that you could settle on in order to go to the west, right? If there was or if there wasn't any unsettled wilderness, then why would they be going there, right? They'd find nothing, right? They're trying to move west to start new lives and to expand America. In order to expand a nation, you need unsettled wilderness, right? The Great Lakes doesn't make sense, right? You can't settle on a lake. Plus, that's in the north. The Great Lakes were already already existed. People already knew about that. Michigan was already a state uh, in 1893, right? A regular coastline also doesn't make sense, right? Because once you reach the coastline, you cannot push west anymore. Right, the coastline, that means that there's ocean here and humans can't live in the ocean, obviously. And the Mohawk Valley also doesn't really make sense, right? It's more in the south. That's that's not really where uh, Western expansion uh, occurred, especially in uh, 1893, right? So 10 says, which federal action is most consistent with the ideas expressed by Frederick, Frederick Jackson Turner in this excerpt, right? So once again, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot here, but his idea here is that America's need, Americans need to continue continually develop land in the West. We need to, not only do we need to expand West, but we also need to make cities there and we need to settle it, right? So obviously the answer to this is going to be the passing of the Homestead Act because the Homestead Act pretty much uh, the, was, was a policy by the government. It said that, listen, if you decide to improve the land in the West, we you can pretty much claim that land. If you settle on that land, if you make a house, if you make a bridge, anything that's considered an improvement or a settlement on that land, and the, the federal government will grant that land to you, right? So let's say I was uh, settling out west. Here's my ox-driven carriage, right? And I come across this, this piece of land, and it has a river on it. And I decide to build a bridge. Because I built that bridge and because I improved on that land, the federal government can give it to me now. They can pretty much say, hey, you, you settled here. And because you settled here, you can have this acre of land, right? Boom. So I think that's pretty much the only one that makes sense. Plessy versus Ferguson was about you know, like civil rights and, and slavery, right? The establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau, once again, something has to do with slavery and passage of the Federal Reserve Act, that's about the economy, right? That's about money. It doesn't make sense. Moving on to 11 and 12, it says, private monopolies are indefensible and intolerable. <clears throat> they destroy competition, control the price of all material and, and of finished product, thus robbing both the pr producer and consumer. They lessen the employment of labor and arbitrarily fix terms and conditions thereof and deprive individual energy and a small capital of their opportunity of betterment. So what this is saying is that monopolies are super, super bad, right? You cannot defend monopolies and you cannot tolerate monopolies because they destroy competition, they destroy price, they control price, they rob from producers and consumers, and they deprive us to better ourselves, right? They're stupid and they're bad, right? So number 11 says, the authors of the passage would be most critical of the activities of which two individuals, right? So pretty much, if you, if the people who wrote this really hate, and I mean hate monopolies, who would they, which actions, whose actions would they also hate, right? So if they hate monopolies, they also probably hate Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie because these guys were owners of monopolies. Remember that Carnegie had steel and <clears throat> John D. Rockefeller had standard oil, right? So they both owned monopolies. So obviously, if, they, if these guys hate monopolies, they're also going to hate the people who started monopolies. Right, William Jenning Bryans and Eugene Debs, right? That doesn't make sense. These were politicians. These guys actually supported uh, trust busting and they supported the destruction of monopolies. Margaret Sanger and Adam James, these were progressive, progressive activists, right? They had nothing to do with monopolies. They just helped immigrants in the American uh, in America, right? Jacob Riz and Ida Tarbell also does not make sense because these were the people, these were muckrakers who were actually uh, like exposing these, these monopolies, right? Number 12 says, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, how did Congress attempt to address these practices, right? So how did uh, the government, during the progressive era, which is between this this time, how did they decide to um, stop 
monopolies and obviously it's they passed antitrust legislation right eventually during the progressive era Amer the american government saw that hey this is really really bad right monopolies are exploiting our workers like crazy they're depriving them of their freedoms we have to do something so in order to do something they passed antitrust legislation remember that a trust is is like old timey speak for a monopoly right and if you're antitrust you're anti-monopoly right trust busting same thing as antitrust right pretty much the government splitting up these companies into to splitting up these monopolies into tiny, tiny companies, right? They did this with Standard Oil. They took this massive Standard Oil company and they split it into like a million different tiny oil companies. So antitrust legislation all the way. Moving on to number 13, we have a photo here. Wonderful. <clears throat> so let's just look at what the photo has to offer. It says $50,000 reward. Who destroyed the main, right? The destruction of the main, this, this, uh, um, this is referring to a ship, the USS Maine, which was blown up and destroyed in the Bay of Cuba. Right. And they're asking us, who did this? Who attacked our ship? <coughs> so here it says destruction of warship Maine uh, was the work of an enemy. They're saying that, hey, this warship was attacked while it was in bay. It says Assistant Secretary Roosevelt convinced the explosion of the ship was not an accident. The journal offers $50,000 reward for the conviction of criminals who sent 258 sailors to their death. They say that the ship was destroyed on purpose. Right. So, um, there was a time in history where the U.S. had a had a ship called the USS Maine. It was a battleship, and it was it was in the port or near the harbor of Cuba, and all of a sudden it just exploded, like it blew up into flames and exploded, and it killed everyone on board. And what they're saying now, this is the headlines of like the next morning. They're like, "Oh my God, our ship, it's gone. Who did this?" Uh, and that's pretty much every, everything here. And as you can see already, like uh, Assistant Secretary Roosevelt, that's the Theodore Roosevelt, right? Gov people in our government are already starting to blame uh, Cuba. They're starting to blame, they're starting to say that it wasn't an accident. Instead, it, this was a deliberate attack on America. But obviously, the war with Spain would be, uh, a historian would most likely use this document to investigate events leading up to what? Well, this was most closely followed by the war with Spain. After this, they were convinced, the American government was pretty much convinced with, um, with the fact with the fact that this was an attack on America by Spain, right, who who controlled Cuba at the time, and they used this as an excuse to declare war on Spain, right? Open door policy doesn't make sense. Invasion of Mexico happened way before this, and the annexation of Alaska. Uh, we bought, we purchased Alex Alaska, and either way, uh, this is on the completely different side of the world, right? Alaska's up here, Cuba is like all the way down there, rather like down here or something. You get the point. Number 14 says, how did the United States foreign policy change in the years immediately following uh, this event, right? So what happened after this? After the uh, after America annexed Cuba, right? And after, well, first of all, they, they blamed the main on Spain, right? That's something you'll hear in school a lot, which means that they blamed the, the explosion of the ship on Spain. And now, since they blamed it on Spain, they're like, hey, what the, what the hell, man? That's not cool that you blew up our ship. We're going to go to war with you. So after this, they went to war with Spain. Spain obviously lost because America had a massive, massive um, navy at this point, right? And, and they had a much better army than, uh, than Spain did, right? So they win the war uh, against Spain. And Spain pretty much gives, them, uh, gives America Cuba. And they also give them the Philippines. And they give them a bunch of like tiny islands in the Pacific, right? So now that America has all this land, obviously, they entered a period of overseas expansion, right? If they have this land across the world, if they now have the Philippines, that's overseas. They're now expanding to the Philippines. They're taking over the Philippines, that which was given to them. They're taking over Cuba, that was given to them. They're given. They're taking over Puerto Rico, which was also given to them by Spain. And they're taking over like Guam and all these other Spanish islands that were given to them, right? So they're expanding overseas because they won this war, right? Policy of containment doesn't make sense, right? That's Cold War uh, containment. Communism wasn't really a thing uh, that the Amer America cared about at this point. Three, United States government became more isolated wrong they be they became super involved in like global politics after this and the united states rejected the goal of manifest destiny also wrong because the united states saw this as an opportunity to continue uh, expanding uh, u.s territory right instead of manifesting in the continent they're manifesting uh like overseas now so um number 15 another image gotta love these images so here it says patterns of african-american migration from the south from 1910 to 1970, right? So this is after the Civil War, um, and what what we're seeing here is that a lot of a lot of African Americans, right? They are fleeing the South. They are moving from the South, from former slave states to northern um, to northern states, right? Or to or to western states, right? Or to midwestern states. But the thing is, the main thing is that there's no one that's going into former slave states, right? There's no one who's going into Texas. They're all leaving Texas. They're all leaving Louisiana, uh, Louisiana. 
Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, right? They're all, they're all leaving, right? So it's asking us, what was the main reason for the movement? Well, the main reason for the movement was to, was that industrialization provided more employment opportunities here in, in the South, right? It's, it's still mainly agricultural. Uh, you know, they're sharecropping, uh, they're, they're being <clears throat> attacked by the KKK, they're being hate crimes constantly. Uh, they're segregated, they have limited rights, people still treat African Americans as slaves, even though slavery has been long abolished, right? They're not seeing any rights, they have poor employment, they're, they're, they're working, still working at farms, uh, where white landowners are taking away all of their money, um, and all of their profits, so they seek jobs elsewhere, right? And the reason they do so during this time period is that America is undergoing another rev uh, industrial revolution, right? There's a major boom in factory jobs in, in the North, a lot of textiles, automobile manufacturing, all of that. They see these these jobs. They see the fact that the North gives them more rights. They um, they see that just the North treats them so much better. They get so much more money. They don't get discriminated against. They uh, they get opportunities. They can start families. And a bunch of African Americans end up leaving the South because of industrialization and because of the amount of jobs there. Right. Uh, number three is wrong because slavery was already abolished. Number two says. Uh, Northern states banned all forms of racial discrimination. This was false, actually. Um, there's still racism going on here. There's still segregation in some states. It's just not as bad as the uh, the South. And foreign food impro imports replace domestic production of crops. I, I think that's wrong, honestly, because the United States was still producing its own food, right? It's mainly, mainly the Great Migration was caused by better job opportunities in the North, right? So we're moving on to number 16. It says, what was the one result of the migration shown above in the map, right? So was it that the South became a new destination for most European immigrants? This is false, right? Most European immigrants continued going to northern states where there were most jobs. Remember that European immigrants usually flocked for manufacturing jobs in major northern cities like Chicago, like New York, like Philadelphia, and like Boston, right? <coughs> right, so this is just false. Usually the trend with immigration is that they, they go through uh, northern, northern territory. So uh, moving on to number two, it says the Democratic Party declined in the northern half of the country. Well, there's not really there's no really way of proving this, right? That the, the the Democratic Party still continued across the entire nation, right? Just because a bunch of African American people moved to the north doesn't mean that there was no longer any Democrats in the north, right? Uh, number three says that American culture was enriched by new forms of music and literature. I think this is it, right? This is the answer. Remember the Harlem Renaissance uh, happened after the Great Migration, right? A bunch of African Americans came to uh, Manhattan. Right, they came to New York City, settled. Uh, they came to the island of Manhattan, um, and there they had a cultural revival. Right, there was there was newfound art, newfound literature, newfound music, poetry, writing, all of that. Right, it was major major development of African American cultures after they moved to the North. Right, the best thing that happened when they moved to the North was that there was now uh, now that the African Americans had more rights here, they had more more uh, rights. They had a greater amount of freedom. They had a greater freedom of expression. They could express themselves more often uh, with, and they had more time on their hands because they weren't constantly overworked like they were in the South. They could actually develop their self-image. They can develop a culture. So that's why it's number three. And the best example is the Harlem Renaissance. So moving on to number 17, or rather uh, the blurb here, it says, I think all men recognize that in time of war, the citizen must surrender some rights for the common good, which he is entitled to enjoy in the time of peace. But sir, the right to control their own government according to the constitutional forms is not one of the rights that the citizens of this country are called upon to surrender in time of war. More than all, the citizen and his represent representative in Congress in time of war must maintain his freedom of speech, his right of free speech. More than in times of peace, it is necessary that the channels for free public discussion of the government policies shall be open and unclogged, right? So this is Guy, he's a senator from Wisconsin. Right. He's, he was this guy was wonderful. He was progressive. He pretty much reformed all of Wisconsin. Beautiful, beautiful guy. And what he's saying here, it, it, this is in October of 1917. So you should be thinking World War One. America is in World War One now. Um, it's saying that he's he's admitting that hey, we're in war, right? We we are allowed to be less free than usual, right? I understand that when we're in war, sometimes because uh, our government wants to limit the amount of espionage, our government wants to remain stable, they can limit some of our rights, right? But he says, he, he then contradicts after this first sentence, and he says that there are some rights that we cannot, that we cannot give up, no matter what, no matter the time of war, no matter anything. And that, that one of those rights is our right for free speech, right? Free discussion of government policies, right? 
He's saying that free discussion of government policies should never, ever, ever be uh, be limited, especially during a time of war, right? It's, it's during that time period that we need it the most, right? So that's pretty much his main point. Number 17 asks, according to the passage, what is one argument in support of free speech during wartime? And the answer to this is number one, citizens must maintain their control uh, the right to control the government even in times of war, right? It's saying here, literally, this, this summarizes these two sentences. More than all, citizens and his representative in Congress in time of war must maintain his right of speech. Boom, right? They have to maintain their right of speech so they can speak out against the government and still give input to the government even though they're in war, right? Citizens must support the decisions of elected officials. I'm not talking about that. Three, military leaders are bound by the Constitution to defend the rights of the people. Once again, not we didn't even talk about military leaders in this blurb. And number four, Congress has the authority to pass laws limiting First Amendment rights. We It literally contradicts that, right? It's saying that in no way, sense, or form should we... Uh, the First Amendment is freedom of speech, right? And here it's saying that no, in no way should our freedom of speech or our First Amendment be infringed upon or taken away. So number 18 says, which Supreme Court decision addresses the issue raised by Senator La Follette? in his speech, right? And the answer to this is going to be Schenck versus United States. Remember that uh, Schenck was, uh, was a guy who got arrested because he was uh, supporting uh, anti-government, anti-U.S. government uh, sentiment within the United States, right? Um, it was during World War One. He was saying that the, the, the um, actions of America weren't the best, that, and he was pretty much uh, spreading around these papers that were that were telling people to not support the U.S. government during a time of war. They were, they were the papers were like the, the government, <clears throat> U.S. government is unjust in its involvement in World War One. It was a German guy, and pretty much the um, the U.S. government it decided to censor him, and they decided to arrest him. Right? They they took away his papers, all all the papers that he wrote, and they pretty much put him in jail. They said, look, you're 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 a threat to national security. Right? You're trying to incite violence and riots in a time of war and pretty much he's like hey this isn't fair this is uh an infringement upon my first amendment right like i could write whatever i want against the u.s government i have a right to do so in the constitution and you guys took that away from me by arresting me that day and that, that was pretty much a big uh supreme court case right no other securities company versus the united states doesn't even have to do with personal rights Plessy v ferguson <clears throat> once again different case Plessy v ferguson was not what wasn't about uh freedom of speech Walsh for St. Louis Pacific Railroad Company. This is, has to do something with railroads. This has nothing to do with railroads, right? So moving on to uh, number 19. Uh, it's a single question, I guess. We, we ran out of pairs. And um, it's, a, it's an image, right? It says, a wise economist asks a question. Okay. So here we have a man. Uh, he seems pretty sad. Right? He's smoking a pipe. And he's labeled a victim of bank failure, right? Notice how this is written in 1931. So think about Great Depression. Right, so the Great Depression, the banks have failed, a bunch of people are poor. And this squirrel, who is a, who's supposed to be a wise economist, is asking this poor guy, why didn't you save money for when the future times were good? I'm uh, sorry, why didn't you save money for the future when times were good, right? So during the roaring 20s, before this whole big Great Depression thing, why weren't you saving money? Don't you think if you put money in the banks, you wouldn't be so poor right now? And he said, I did, right? Remember that during the Great Depression, literally the banks ran out of money. The banks failed, right? People lost their entire life savings. So it doesn't matter how much money you had in the bank before the Great Depression, the bank literally lost all your money <coughs> because they failed, right? Um, and this guy is a victim of that. And this and, and this wise economist simply doesn't understand that fact, right? So number 19 says, why were President Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover and the Republican Party unable to solve the problem addressed in the cartoon, right? All right? I guess this isn't really related to it, but just think about that. This is this is about bank failure and that this is about the Great Depression, right? And remember that Herbert Hoover poorly, poorly managed it because he didn't let the federal government really do anything to, to intervene, right? He didn't believe in government handouts. He strongly, strongly opposed that the government should interfere in public in, in, in this uh, event. He thought that people should support themselves, that people should resolve the issue themselves, and that the government cannot intervene in this because it's simply unvirtuous and unright, right? So that's choice number one. Herbert Hoover never let the government intervene uh, in, in almost anything. And that's why he, he was super unpopular. And that's why FDR uh, ended up becoming president. And FDR believes in government uh, intervention in economic activity, right? 
Number two is wrong because the problem existed everywhere, not just in rural areas. Number three says they thought that foreign influences were the primary cause of the bank crisis. They weren't and they didn't. The, the, the bank crisis was a fault of American banking system. Uh, number four says they believe the federal government must pay back those who lost money due to stock speculation. This is this goes against what he thought, right? The government, the they, uh, Herbert Hoover thought the government shouldn't pay back anyone, that they could prick themselves off their feet themselves, right? So number 20, <clears throat> trying to change the umpiring, right? So this is a baseball game. Uh, this is uh, President Roosevelt, FDR, right? He says, I, listen, I don't like your decisions. From now on, you're going to have to work with someone who can see things my way, right? And here's the Supreme Court. So pretty much in baseball, the umpire is like the, the judge. He pre he makes the calls of the game. If he doesn't see, if he sees like someone batting improperly, he'll be like, strike, or he'll just throw you out of the game, right? And here's President um, FDR, and he's, he's, he's holding a bat, right? And the umpire is about to throw him out. He says, no good, no good. Right, use a new bat. And here there's new new more New Deal laws. And here is all the, the the New Deal policies, right, which were deemed unconstitutional. So this guy, the umpire, keeps on telling the president, Theodore Roosevelt, that his deals are unconstitutional. That's all this is saying, right? President Roosevelt uh decided to like just pump out program after program after program of public assistance that was supposed to help America recover uh through the um Great Depression, right? They did like tax refunds they did these programs to create more job for the jobs for the american people and more employment and a lot of this a lot of them got shut down by the supreme court right so number 20 says what was the reason for president fdr reaction to the supreme court as shown in the cartoons like so why is he so bad at the supreme court and obviously the answer is that several new deal programs have been invalidated right look at him in the photo right he's super super angry because he doesn't like your decisions right he doesn't like the umpire's decisions because the umpire's decisions are are deeming his his bats or his laws unconstitutional, right? He wants his deals to be passed. He want because he thinks that this can solve America's problems. This guy is stopping him from changing America, and this guy is stopping him from making America uh like taking them out of the Great Depression, right? So he's angry at them because the the uh he's invalidating New Deal policies, right? And the New Deal was uh, a set of laws that was supposed to um a set of laws and programs that was supposed to take America out of the Great Depression. House of Representatives, nothing to do with this. Supreme Court justices have been removed from the office. If they had been removed from the office, this guy would be happy because Supreme Court justices were ruining his plan, right? Congress had failed to pass any New Deal legislation. This has nothing to do with Congress because it's the Supreme Court that's <clears throat> that is uh uh because it's the Supreme Court that's that's deeming things unconstitutional. Only the Supreme Court can do that. All right, nice another photo. It says <clears throat> Western Defense Command and Fourth Army Wartime Civil Control Administration. Presidino of South California, of San Francisco, California, April 1st, 1942. Instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry living in the following area. All that portion of the city and county of San Francisco, state of California, lying generally west and north of the line established by that boulevard, Worcester Avenue, and 19th Avenue, and lying generally north of east-west line established by California Street to the intersection of Market Street and thence on Market Street to the San Francisco Bay. Right? So it's pretty much saying everyone who lives in this area who's of Japanese ancestry, which means that like you're Japanese or, you're, or someone you know, or not someone you know, but someone in your family is Japanese, right? So all Japanese person, both alien and non-alien, will be evacuated from the above designated area at 12 o'clock noon, Tuesday, April 7th, right? No Japanese person will be permitted to enter or leave above described area after 8 a.m. Thursday, April 2nd, 1942, without, a pair, uh, without obtaining special uh, permission from Provert, Provost Marshall at the civil control situation station located at this avenue, right? So pretty much just saying that this was, this was the uh, America's anti-Japanese uh, policy, right? This was during World War II. America was in a war, it was in World War II. They were primarily fighting against uh, Germany in Europe and Japan in the Pacific theater, right? And a lot of American politicians saw Japanese people as a threat. They, uh, especially after Pearl Harbor, they thought that Japanese people could attack America, that they served it to, to weaken the American government, right? They thought that the Japanese were dangerous. And in order to combat this, and in order to, you know, cope with these fears, the America uh, Americans pretty much had a Japanese removal policy where they put Japanese people in these, like, internment camps uh, where and they they pretty much segregate them from the general public because they thought that these Japanese people had connections to their homeland, that they were spying, that they were capable of terrorism, right? And this is pretty much a poster that was given to a bunch of Japanese people living in San Francisco that ordered them to leave, right? They were um they were pretty much saying if you're Japanese and you live in San Francisco in this area, you're no longer living there. We're taking you to a camp, right? So which situation led uh 
led to the issue of this order, obviously, I just said, it's going to be Japanese attack on, on Pearl Harbor, right? Japanese people attack, uh, Japanese military attack Pearl Harbor. U.S. government started seeing the Japanese <clears throat> as, um, as a threat to national security, right? Uh, lack of adequate housing on the West Coast. <laughs> That'd be nice, but no, uh, it's, it's solely about that, right? 1940s, remember? 1942 specifically, right? Widespread acts of espionage by Japanese Americans. I guess how you would make this, how this would make sense. But really, the main the main motivator is Pearl Harbor. If it wasn't for Pearl Harbor, they wouldn't have done this, right? Efforts to deport Japanese Americans, they're not deporting them here. They're just moving them into private security camps along uh, the West Coast, right? So what Supreme Court case upheld the constitutionality of this order, it's going to be two, Korematsu versus United States. There's this one Japanese guy who, who, who said, hey, this is a violation of my civil rights. Uh, you cannot take me out of here. You cannot do this. You're, you're violating my Bill of Rights. You're violating my amendments and the United States. And he took it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, listen, you know, we can uphold this. We're in a time of war. And this is something that we need. This is necessary to our national security, right? So 22 is choice number two. Miranda V. Uh, beating V. Wainwright, Map V. Ohio has nothing to do with this, right? Not even on the West Coast. Uh, Miranda V. Arizona happened much later. This, is, this established the Miranda rights, by the way. So, basic question. All right, so another photo. Wonderful. So, here we have Joseph Stalin, right? You can tell by his wonderful mustache and by the uh, Soviet Union hammer and sickle on the back of his shirt, right? And it's a basketball game. And it, it, it's like, so here, President Marshall, or, or, or there was the um, President Truman approved the Marshall Plan, right? So, so President Truman shot his shot. And the Marshall Plan was pretty much a plan uh, instilled by the U.S. government after World War II that pretty much sought, like, the reconstruction of, of Europe after the World War II. Like, World War II completely devastated that entire continent. And the United States recognized that in order to avoid a World War III, in order to avoid a, a completely new world war, you need to first make sure that Europe is stable after this war before anything. Because pretty much what happened, what caused World War II is the fact that... Um, the Allied powers treated Germany horribly. They never let them recover. They just poured sanction after sanction. And because <clears throat> they poured sanction after sanction, like they pushed Germany to such an extreme that a second world war was their only way out of it, right? Now, the US government acknowledges that that was really bad of them, that instead of punishing them, they need to make sure that they can recover so that they don't turn to war again. Um, and that's so people just don't needlessly suffer, right? And the Marshall Plan was pretty much this like billion dollar plan the United States government did uh, to order the reconstruction of Europe, right? But it was also, it was also in a sense motivated by, uh, you know, the desire to to make sure that communism stayed out of Europe. Pretty much, uh, the Americans thought that hey, if we continue pouring money into European governments, they'll see that capitalism and democracy helps. Why does it help? Because well, they give you money and they help you rebuild your nation, right? And thusly, because they help you rebuild your nation, you should further align with capitalism and democracy instead of communism, right? That's pretty much what's happening here, right? And Joseph Stalin really didn't like this because he saw this as an attack on the Soviet Union, right? Uh, and he's trying to block the Marshall Plan. So number 23, what was the main purpose of the Marshall Plan? Didn't we just say this? It was to contain the spread of communism, right? Um, none, none of these other choices make sense. First of all, the Marshall Plan mainly uh, was, yes, it was to support the um, spread of communism. But additionally, it was supposed to rebuild Europe, right? right. Um, the US government really feared that when a, when a nation was so devastated that they would turn to communism, the Marshall Plan was supposed to show those devastated nations that democracy and capitalism uh, equals recovery and prosperity, right? And that if you align yourself under capitalism, your nation will rebound, it will regrow, and uh, it'll prosper, right? So it was pretty much to, to stop uh, these poor nations from turning to communism. Uh, other ones don't make sense. Revolutions in the Middle East didn't happen like until 30 years later, maybe. Expand the United States territory? Absolutely not. We stopped that a while ago. Uh, to develop better relations with the Soviet Union, this actually harmed relations with the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is pretty much trying to stop this plan from even happening, right? They don't want this to happen. So 24 says the Soviet response to the Marshall Plan contrib contributed to what? Well, obviously it's not going to be four, right? The NATO only intensified after this. Matter of fact, NATO like started forming in the, immediately after World War II, and, it, and NATO is still a thing here, right? By here, I mean to this like modern day. Number 24 says, <clears throat> sorry, number choice number one says a decline in United States European trade. Wrong. This pretty much linked their two economies directly together, right? United States would offer to trade with these devastated countries to, to make sure that their economies would properly rebound. Number uh, 22, increased 
sorry, <laughs> choice number two, increased aid to African nations also doesn't make sense. The Marshall Plan really only helped European nations. So really, it, it, it contributed to the Cold War is what I'm trying to say here, right? Pretty much, Joseph Stalin saw this as a personal attack, uh, as an act of, an, uh, of aggression to limit communism. And all this did was increase tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States, right? So moving on to number 25 and 26. So uh, this is a resolution, and it's, I think this is from the United Nations, but we'll read further, right? So says, section one, this joint resolution may be cited as the War Powers Resolution. Purpose and Policy, section two. A, it is the, pur the purpose of this joint resolution to fulfill the intent of the framers of the Constitution of the United States to ensure that the collective judgment of both Congress and the president will apply to the introduction of the United States armed forces into hostiles or into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by the circumstances and to continued use of such forces in hostility or in such situation. Right? Then it goes to C. The constitutional powers of the United of the president as commander in chief to introduce the United States armed forces into hostilities or into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by circumstances are exercised by Exercise only pursuant to a, de a declaration of war, specific statutory authorization, or a natural emergency created by the attack upon the United States, its territories, possession, or armed forces. Right. So pretty much this is saying that like what can the United States do? Uh, like what can you declare war on? Like how when you're trying to when you are fighting with someone, how is it to be done? Right. <coughs> so here it's saying that the president of the United States can only really declare war. Uh, and it can only really, in, sorry, they say the president of the United States, right, and the president of other nations can only uh, involve their militaries after they declare a war, after a specific uh, authorization, or after a national emergency created by an attack, right? This is the only situations that you can uh, dec uh, mobilize your military and, like, utilize it, right? So knowing this, number 25 asks, the purpose of this law was to what? Well, it's to limit, it, limit the powers of the president from involving the U United States in extended wars, right? The whole thing that's saying this is is um, the, the government, rather the president, can only de uh, deploy the military when A, B, and C happens. When there's a de declaration of war, when a specific uh, authorization is done, or when an, an, a national emergency uh, is created by an attack, right? So it's pretty much given a set uh, of boundaries to how the United, to how the president can present the idea of war or the idea of military involvement to Congress and how he could enact it. Number 26 is which uh, event most directly led to the passage of this act? It's going to be choice three, the involvement in the Vietnam War, right? This is, first of all, it's in 1973, right? So uh, the involvement in the Vietnam War uh, is probably the closest thing chronologically that will uh, that will line up with this. But also number two, like uh, the whole reason that the United that the president has to have limited powers when declaring war on people is because of how he declared war and how he started the Vietnam War, right? It was it was very very um, how to, I don't know how to say this, but unclear who really was the aggressor the aggressor in the Vietnam War, who really started it, right? The whole reason it started was because of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, right? Where apparent allegedly Vietnam Vietnamese forces fired upon uh, a United States patrol ship. And pretty much um, the president at the time saw this as proper authorization to declare war on um, on Vietnam, right? And involved the United States there because of that interaction in the Gulf of Tonkin, right? But really, it, it, there's, it was really debated whether, whether it, w it was necessary, whether this was legitimately a, um, a direct attack or if this was a genuine mistake, right? But the way that the government worked at that time is that there was no check and balances and there was no limit to how the president could declare war on someone. As long as he could sell it in a way that seemed like it was an attack on the nation, uh, Congress would agree to declare war as well. But after the involvement of the Vietnam War and after after like countless leaks of government documents, a lot of people started to see that, hey, the government's involvement in this war is pretty messed up. We're committing war crimes. We, we, we are like aggressing these innocent civilians. We, we even started this war on murky grounds. Like we didn't even know what happened. So in order to prevent a future Vietnam, in order to prevent future conflicts like that, they decided to limit the president's ability to uh, declare war on others, right? So moving on to number 27, it's a photo. It says, Lyndon B. Johnson signs the Voting uh, Rights Act as Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders took on look on at the United States Capitol, right? So he is Lyndon B. Johnson. He is signing the Voting Rights Act, which is um, a part of the <coughs> Civil Rights Act, right? It's a, it's a major civil rights legislation saying that black people, sorry, African-Americans, uh, can vote 
unrestricted, that is unconstitutional to, to uh, uh, pretty much limit that uh, voting right to any citizen of the United States, regardless of race, right? That race should not play a role in someone's ability to vote, right? And he's signing that into office as all these uh, notable civil rights leaders and civil rights advocates look on, right? So now it's asking what presidential role is being demonstrated, right? So obviously it's not going to be choice number one. How is he a commander in chief of the armed forces? If this was a bunch of soldiers, it would make sense, but it's not, right? It's civil activists. Commander in chief means that he's leading a military, right? Two, granting reprieves and pardons for federal offenses. This is also wrong because he's signing an act into law, right? He's not pardoning a criminal. He's not pardoning anyone. Three, treaty making powers of foreign nations. That also doesn't make sense, right? Because what foreign nation, this is a domestic policy. This is saying that in the United States, anyone can vote. And four, chief executive approving congressional bills, right? This is the, this is the only answer that really makes sense. This, this was literally a bill. The Voting Rights Act started as a bill. He's signing it into office because he is a chief executive, right? He's chief executive of the United States. The executive branch can sign laws into, uh, or can enact laws. So moving on to number 28, it says, what was one way the voting, the voting Rights Act expanded the rights of African Americans, right? Obviously, the answer is going to be three. It's great. It outlawed the, out, the use of literacy tests, right? This made sure that every single person could vote in the United States. And by vote, I mean they could vote without having to undergo any of these uh, discriminatory policies that they use uh, that, that were already in place. Uh, you didn't have to pay a fees. You didn't have to prove that you could read or write. As long as you were a natural bo uh, born U.S. citizen, you were now granted the right to vote. What happened in a lot of southern states was pretty much southern governments would put on these tests uh call literacy tests and like grandfather clauses they could say that you could only vote if your grandfather could vote or you could only vote if you could uh, fill out this test and they made these tests extremely extremely confusing and they made sure uh that like these tests had subjects that african-american uh people just simply could not understand right they were, they were a lot of people did not know how to read back then because the south the south didn't allow african-americans to attend schools and they didn't allow them to actually learn how to read so so they you know Southern governments really try to vote, uh, limit uh, how many African Americans could vote by making these like outrageous laws and claims, right? And pretty much what this bill did was it was it reversed that and said that hey, you can't pass these acts anymore. It's unconstitutional. Everyone has a right to vote, and you can't limit that no matter what. Um, number four, integration of public schools. That's a different act. This is about voting. Discrimination in public facilities. <coughs> Once again, that was a different act. This is solely limited to voting. It stopped the practice of sharecropping. Obviously, this is for limited voting and literacy tests were um, in vote or were, are related to voting, right? So that's one through 28. That was the entire multiple choice section complete. I hope this was an in-depth review. I tried to make this as in-depth as possible. Please let me know how this went. This is my first time doing like a non-STEM, non-science or math related um, regents review. So if you want like part two, uh, part two or part three, part three A for me to go over uh, in future videos, please let me know in the comments. If you like what you saw, please leave a like. If you want more stuff like this, please subscribe. I hope you learned something and I hope you have a nice day.